Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Thomas Hendricks, I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry. Past guests of Legends Behind the Craft include Michael Houlihan, founder of Barefoot Wines, Yuan G of Erstwhile Mezcal, and Ryan Thompson of 10th Mouth and Whiskey. If you haven't listened to these yet, check them out and subscribe. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. The barrels we work with you to implement a one-of-a-kind marketing strategy, lights your authenticity, tells your story, and connects you with your ideal customers. In short, we help wineries and craft beverage producers unlock their story to unleash their revenue. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. Today, Bianca Harmon's also joining us. Bianca is a direct consumer marketing strategist at Barrels Ahead. If you want to level up your direct consumer game, give her a call. How's it going, Bianca? It's going good, Drew. I am excited to talk with John today and learn more about building a liquor brand. Yes, yes. Today's guest is John McDonald, and he's um, a true legend in the spirits industry. As president of Patroni, expanded the brand into over 130 countries and grew its revenue from 75 million to 600 million. <laughs> Impressive. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being on. So, John, I, you're a busy guy. I've got to just jump straight to it. What's the secret to building an international brand? Lots of luck. <laughs> the, the, the secret to building Patron globally was because the two biggest players in the tequila space at the time, Diageo and Pernod, were asleep at the switch. Mm. So the way we attacked it was we went into duty-free shops and noticed oh. that they had all expensive brands, you know, $30, $40, $50 and above. But when you looked at the tequila category, the only thing they were selling was $8 bottles of Cuervo and Sousa. So mm. we went to the operators and said, hey, how come you don't have a super premium tequila in your portfolio? And they all scratched their heads and said, I really don't know why. That's a good question. So I said, well, give us a shot. So we attacked the duty-free outlets first, and that's what got Patron started globally mm. and then the other thing is when you talk about tequila you ask anybody hey do you have a tequila story and nine out of ten people are going to give you a very bad tequila story <laughs> because they just shoot it and they you know get sick during their college days oh, yeah. so we started sampling people on Patron and we told the tasting people do not call it tequila, just call it Patron. Patron's a brand, forget the category. And then mm. people would sip it and go, oh my God, that's great. What is it? And we'd say, that's a tequila. And they said, we don't ever remember tequila tasting like that. It would, so it, it worked out well for us. And then, you know, the rest is history. They sold it for $5.1 billion to Bacardi. Mm. It's quite an exit. I yeah, didn't realize sure. that they sold to Bacardi. When did they do that, John? Um, don't call me exactly to the date, about three to four years ago. Okay. And, yeah, they, Patron, sorry, Bacardi had owned about 27% of Bacardi. Of Bacardi owned 27% mm -hmm. of Patron. And that was through um, a charitable organization that they ended up acquiring that percentage. So they were always figured to be the lead dog to take out Patron. Interesting. And then that's when you made your exit. Oh, I made my exit um, a couple years before that because I was friends with another gentleman in the industry and he wanted me to help him take his brand internationally. Oh, yeah. So I was, I was up for another challenge at the time. But at the time, your time at Patron, you really um, kind of emphasized the sustainability and the environmental aspects of the brand as well. Did that help? What role did that play in its growth? Well, as a plant-based product coming from an agave plant, it played a huge role in the brand success. It, we're also spent a lot of time 
giving away money to charities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that comes back to you multiple ways when people know that you're doing good. You know, today's generation of millennials and iGen, you know, they're very interested in three things, digital convenience, social responsibility, and lastly, sustainability. So when I was interviewing for jobs growing up in the industry, I never thought about asking an employer, well, what do you do to give back to society? Mm -hmm. You know, now when I interview people, you know, you have to convince them that they should come work for you because Mm -hmm. you give back and, you know, care about the world. It's a very different place than when I started, you know, 38, 39 years ago. Yeah, it's really changed. You got to have the social responsibility. And I like the, um, just to jump back when you're talking about the duty-free stores, that is a great, um, as far as getting placed and do every duty-free store, does it have, is it, is it a central outlet to get them or is each duty-free store run independently in each country? That, that's a very good question. So the number one player in duty-free is a company called Do Free. Mm-hmm. So they have locations globally, but they, no one player like controls all the United States duty-free stores so it's a it's a it's fragmented but there's about five to six players that you know control over 50 percent of the duty-free shops and you know i don't know if you're aware of this in duty when you're talking about duty-free they have to bid on the concession so take boston as an example uh international shops is the concessionaire at boston duty-free and they also have Houston, Philadelphia, New York. And they require to make 68 to 70% profit margin on each sale. And the reason the profit margins are so big is because most airport authorities take Massachusetts Airport Authority. They take the first 50% of the profit. And that's mm. the model for duty-free. So while it's a very important channel and it's, you know, if you're not there, people don't view you as a global brand. It's extremely expensive and it's the least profitable channel in the spirits industry. Yeah, I would, I would think so. Yeah, 50% big. That's a it's almost lobster level. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd use a different term, but that's okay. <laughs> I call it as I heard it. <laughs> True. But as we're as you're building this global brand across there, you've got this whole changing consumer. And I know you have a um you've got a you know you're you're well sought and you're a sought after speaker. How how has the consumer segment changed this evolved over the last over the years? And how does a liquor brand confront that and deal with it? Well, the the, the nice thing about being in the spirits industry of total beverage alcohol is that the demographics are working in our favor. Now Mm -hmm. more and more people are drinking spirits at the expense of wine and beer. Mm -hmm. And part of what you're trying to do when you're addressing, let's call it people 35 and under, Mm -hmm. you, you have to show that you are socially responsible and care about sustainability. So I just, returned from London and I was speaking at an e-commerce conference called eTail and the majority of people at that conference were 35 and under and the, I was talking about the topic of my presentation was uh, high tech high touch mm-hmm. and what's happening in the spirits industry now in many industries is that Technology is pulling us away from social interaction. So in an increasingly high-tech world, there's the need for human interaction. Mm. So let me give you an example of this. Um, And I'll equate it back to liquor. Banking, the banking industry started forcing us to do our business online. Mm. So And this only worsened during the pandemic. So 70% of Americans do their banking either on their computer or on their smartphone. And then the banks all of a sudden realized, holy smokes, I don't know any of my customers. So how are you going to sell goods and services 
to customers that you have no relationship with. So Capital Bank, Capital One Bank, started cleverly putting Pete's Coffee Shops in their banks. Yes. And that attracts the iGen and millennials. And now they go in there to get their coffee. Capital One offers free financial advice. They give free snacks and free Wi-Fi. And I don't know where you're based, but if you walk by any Capital One bank, and this is seven days a week, you can't get in them. Hmm. They're, just, they're just slammed. So uh, and it, it's creative. But Crate and Barrel is another good example. If they're starting to test restaurants in their stores. So really? you can, yeah, you sit down and you, you, you get Kia model, you get, get those meatballs and yeah. And you, and you, you're using the silverware, the plates, mm-hmm. the glasses. Oh, I and get, if yeah. you like them, it creates a reason for you to buy on the spot. Yeah. And they, and, and they get you to stay there. You know, I, I was thinking back when my children were smaller, I used to take them to Barnes and Noble bookstore, put mm-hmm. them in the kids book section, go grab a, cup of coffee at Starbucks, which was in the Barnes and Noble. Mm-hmm. And they, they were playing. I got to read the newspaper and yes, I am. I still hold the newspaper and read it. Uh-huh. unlike millennials. And, <laughs> and it was, it, it was a great day. Mm-hmm. And so liquor is liquor is the same way. Yeah, how does that translate? So what we have to do is we need to create in store tasting opportunities so that we can get the consumer to come over to our tasting booth and then we can have a one-to-one conversation with them and then they taste the brand if they like it they can purchase it on the spot there's nothing worse than buying something that you don't know if you like it or not so then and then you're capturing their their email addresses and uh, another thing we did was everybody likes to belong to a club So we had a a special Patron club that people joined. And then we sent them nice little gifts, you know, a couple times a year to create that one-to-one relationship. That's that's, that's some good tips. That that one-to-one is is so important across all aspects right now. Why, what do you think the um, impetus was like for the rise of spirits within the younger generation and the move away from wine and beer? I'd say it's for from a health perspective. People, you know, were cognizant of, you know, they drink beer, they get full. Mm-hmm. And then wine is, you know, there's a lot of a lot of sugars. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, think about if you're sitting at a, a restaurant, you're chit-chatting with a bunch of people. If you're at a, a company function and you you always turn to look at the person you're talking to and the mm-hmm. waiter his, his motivation is he wants to keep emptying bottles of wine and bring in more. So you, at the end of the day, you have no idea how many glasses of wine you drank because the guy's filling up your glass all the time. So, um, and plus the renaissance of mixed spirits, mm-hmm. you know, bourbon and rye have come back in a, in a big way. Mm-hmm. And, and also during the pandemic, we, we, did, a, we did some consumer research 32% of consumers now believe that they're self-proclaimed mixologists. Because what happened during the yeah. first few months of the mm-hmm. pandemic, we were all getting our liquor delivered to our, our homes. And then, you know, at, we ignored what Dr. Fauci said, and then we got all our friends over and we entertained at home mm-hmm. because we needed the humor, human interaction. So um, the revival of, of, of cocktails has come back in a big way. Oh, absolutely. The craft cocktail is really in its, it's really in a renaissance time right now. Come a long way from Tom Cruise's cocktail movie. Yes, this is true. I wanna, um, if it's okay, I want to shift with no segue to something we talked about in the pre-show to a term I've never heard before, the stupid grandson theory. Okay, so <laughs> you gotta tell me about. That. <laughs> all right, so the I'll give you uh, the real life example of this, and this is what I'm going to tell you is now a case study at Harvard Business School. Mm-hmm. So, 
I used to work for a company called Joseph E. Seagram and Sons Liquor Company. They they had brands that you'll recognize. Captain Morgan Rum, Crown Royal, Chivas Regal, Martel Cognac, Glen Livet, just to name a few. They were the biggest and baddest liquor company on the planet. Mm -hmm. And it was started by a gentleman called Samuel Bronfman. He was a gentleman out of Canada, Montreal, Canada. So he started, uh, he was a bootlegger. And, mm -hmm. and his main competitor was a guy named Joe Kennedy, who was father of President Kennedy. Oh, yeah. And so Samuel Bronfman built this company primarily in the United States. And he turned it over to his oldest son, Enka Bronfman Sr., who grew the business into a global empire. And then... This company also owned 24.5% of DuPont Chemical Company. The money, the dividends they were making just on that investment were through the roof. So this company, Seagram, was making, um, a, don't hold me to it because now I'm dating myself, but approximately $800 million EBITDA per year. He turned the son over to his, his son, Edgar Bronfman Jr., who was the grandson. Mm. Edgar Bronfman Jr. decided that DuPont Chemical Company wasn't sexy enough, so he sold off that investment. And he bought universal theme parks and music. Mm. And of course, they were big in tapes and records and all this when people weren't buying tapes and records anymore. So he eventually ran the company into the ground and the consultants told him he had to sell the company. So that is the stupid grandson theory. So if you, a lot of companies never make it to the fourth generation. So Diageo and Pernod ended up buying half the brands of Seagram each. And um, you're familiar with Pernod Ricard, I take it? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, Pernod Ricard, was really just an Irish whiskey company. And of course they had Perno and a few other brands, but they were really nothing in the scheme of things. And this, now they're the second biggest liquor company in the world because of this screw up by Edgar Bronfman Jr. Unbelievable. Yeah. So it's, it's just really, it's, it, it's disappointing. It ended up that way. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Trickle down someone. By the time the third generation comes around there, they've, they've lost touch of the, the history and the, and the motivation and they want to kind of carve out their own, their own interests. Yeah, that's exactly correct. So as, as, you're, as you're growing, so is it, what advice do you have like, for somebody setting up a legacy that wants to build a brand that spans more than... <laughs> a little more than just don't give it to your grandson, but how, do, how does somebody build a brand that lasts multi-generations past three and four? I have a, I've, the, the easy answer to that is have a very good succession plan in place that's mm -hmm. not necessarily, you know, your family. Mm -hmm. just, I, I, um, I finished watching, um, I can't think of the name of it, you'll know, you know, the Uber show recently oh we, we crashed no no that was that was we work <laughs> right I, I just finished we work also and and i think about those companies and how they were taking other people's money and just spending it you know on themselves not thinking about the shareholder and mm -hmm. that's happened in the liquor business as well a lot of people that are starting out the founders they might be great at creating new brands but they're not necessarily the right person to be the CEO. So you need to know, you got to look in the mirror and be really brutally honest with yourself and say, this is a great idea, but let me give it to somebody else that knows the industry to build it. The, the spirits industry, you know, it's this very small, tight knit fraternity. And mm -hmm. if you don't know somebody in that fraternity, the likelihood of you succeeding is slim to none. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example of why it's so small. In, um, in the 80s, the, I was working in Florida, the state of Florida, and I had 14 to 15 different liquor distributors. Mm -hmm. 
And then again, going back to the Seagram Liquor Company, they took the decision that there was just too many liquor distributors. So they started out on consolidating the liquor distributors. So mm-hmm. we went from 14 to 15 to only one. Yeah. So in the United States now, you might have, you have two major liquor distributors in the country and, you know, a third much smaller and then maybe a few others. So the mm-hmm. options of getting into a liquor distributor are extremely challenging now. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, if you're not in the know, the chances are you're going to have a very difficult time latching onto a distributor. Yeah. And we're very heavily regulated as an industry. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. But it's, it's something like LibDib that's kind of empowering small craft producers to be able to get into the three tier system. It seems like there is there is some headway being made to kind of unconsolidate the industry. There, there absolutely is the challenge, and I'm not speaking about the, that company specifically, mm-hmm. but there are a lot of smaller companies in certain states that they give you another option, but they might only be able to call on three or four hundred accounts in that state. Mm-hmm. They don't have the reach that you need to truly build a brand. Yeah, a lot of the smaller ones, they almost seem like kind of a um, a hybrid of the direct consumer. Like it's within the three tier, but a lot of it's up to you to get the get the product out there to the market. It, it, you hit the nail on the head with that. A lot of times when you go to a distributor and say, hey, can you carry me? They say, go show us some business first and then we'll take you on. So, um, you know, I'm sure I'll get a lot of backlash after my next statement. But uh, uh, sometimes liquor distributors are looked upon as just being glorified um, logistics companies. Mm-hmm. You have to do all the work and they just make the delivery for you. <laughs> but yeah, you're talking about Captain Morgan's. That's yeah. So, so, so people you know, were gun shy about sampling it. And it was 80 proof when it was introduced. So... Uh, the company spent a fortune. There wasn't an account you would go into that didn't have a Captain Morgan Spice Rum cleat mirror on mm-hmm. the wall. We had one so, in our liquor store. Yeah, so, well, great. I'm glad you can relate. And they, so the company said, we're, we're bleeding money here. So they called us all to a national meeting and they rolled out Captain Morgan Spice Rum 48 proof. And the team went ballistic. We don't want that. So ultimately, they were going to discontinue it, but they decided that they would compromise and introduce Captain Morgan Spice Rum at 70 proof. So so if they didn't make that decision, they would have discontinued it. And now the brand's four to five million cases in the, in the U.S. And then I think the other story you were referring to was Bacardi ignored that there was such a thing as a spiced rum category. So yeah. had, had Bacardi seen Captain Morgan Spice Rum come out, if they had launched immediately, they could have killed Captain Morgan. But they, they ignored it. And I can't remember the exact dates, but like eight to 10 years after Captain Morgan came out, they launched Bacardi Spice Rum and the consumer said, no, you're not a spice rum. That's, that belongs to Captain Morgan. You're a white rum. And they've tried three times in the last close to 40 years to come out with a Bacardi spice rum and have failed miserably each time. Wow. So they just missed their mark, basically. Yes. It's, so you need to do consumer research and make sure that you understand what you're launching before you do. Do you think that doing the research in those duty-free stores is a good starting point for somebody like you did? Or that would, or well, would that I, just be more for distribution purposes? No, more for, you know, it would be more for consumer insights, which uh, let me share another story with you. That um, the owner of Patron and the CEO told me that they wanted me to launch 
Patron lime, Patron coconut, and Patron yeah. orange. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I said, I am absolutely not doing that until we do focus groups and show this to the consumer and get their feedback. Mm-hmm. So I've participated in numerous consumer research projects in my career. Never in my life have I witnessed the anger and outrage of the Patron consumer when we showed them these packages. They said, you already have flavors. Your flavors are Silva, Reposado, and Añejo. Mm-hmm. And you're not a you know, Patron Lime, Patron Orange, Patron Coconut type of mm-hmm. brand. And if you launch that, we won't drink them. So we never launched them. And I'd say six months to a year later, Cuervo launched flavors and they failed miserably. That vanilla might be the worst tasting thing I've ever tried. (laughs) Just be honest. Just let let people add their own flavoring. Just (laughs) what you're good at making. That's bingo. That's exactly correct. Yep. And stay Stop true to who to you are in everything. Mm-hmm. I, I agree completely. You got to stay stay the course on your mission. Yeah, listen. Now, it, we're talking about Patron and staying true to the mission and the um, just the purity of the brand. You always had such a distinctive, like natural glass bottle. I mean, that right. that really just emphasized the whole um, high endness of it, but also the naturalness of it. That, that's correct. And every, the, the um, paper tissue that went around the, the bottle in the box were all done by hand. Mm. Even as big as the brand has grown, all that was done by hand, which people really appreciated. And the cork is distinctive on the packaging as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I want to sh- shift as we're kind of getting towards the end of this thing. And I w- really want to know, how do you stay motivated in the spirits industry over the last, you know, your tenure and all your jobs? Um, definitely know when to leave a job and go on to the, the next venture. It's because if you don't, you, you need to keep challenging yourself. So, I mean, I I don't change jobs like, Today's generation does, obviously, but mm-hmm. the um, I, I I just like to look at other projects, and then you know on the side I invest in brands that keeps me motivated. I I mentor people that are trying to start new brands, and uh, I'd say I would get at least a call a week on somebody showing me projects. So if I have time, I always try to sit down and see what people are trying to mm-hmm. develop or introduce. And I'll share another story with you. Most projects that people present to me, I, I say to them very nicely, please don't do this. Mm-hmm. And then most of the time they get very annoyed with me because I, I try to be as honest as I can be. And then I have to ask them, well, how much money do you want to put against this project? And they say, uh, two to $3 million. So I say, I'll tell you what, why don't you give me a million dollars, you keep a million dollars, and then you're going to be ahead of the game. That's <laughs> the chances of this succeeding are slim to none. You, you need a boatload of money to launch a brand. Mm-hmm. You know, because you, you, you will not succeed if, unless you do some social media in, in programs with the distributors and retailers. And when I say programs with the retailers, I don't mean under the table money. I mean tastings and promotions, mm-hmm. et cetera. Yes. So how, how, do, how does a young, or how does a fledgling entrepreneurial craft spirit company make it? They need to have a very good board of directors that come from the industry and it needs to be well-rounded. Somebody that understands distribution, somebody that understands marketing, and someone that understands finance and has the relationships. Because unless, again, sorry to repeat myself, but if you don't have somebody that knows the people, you're dead man walking. Sure. Yeah. And having a connected board and also an independent board to preserve you from that stupid grandson. That's that's correct. I, I don't know. Did you ever read the uh, the article or stories about Jeffrey Immelt, who 
who was the CEO of General Electric, he he had a board that don't hold me to this, but I think they were paid in the vicinity of three hundred thousand dollars a year plus mm-hmm. travel and everything that Jeffrey Immelt proposed to the board. They did exactly what you said. They rubber stamped it, whether it was good for the shareholders or not. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, Jack Welsh said that his biggest regret in life was proposing that Jeffrey Immelt took over General Electric because the stock never recovered. Yeah, I I can't. Yeah, we just need to both emphasize. I mean, you can't have a puppet board of directors and expect yourself to grow beyond just the singular vision of the founder. And you got to kind of ask yourself, if you're going to just be a founder, do you really need that board? Or do you really want to use it the way that it's intended as this independent oversight? Yeah, I mean, I just, I keep thinking about the show we were talking about, Uber Mm -hmm. and Ariana Huffington. She she was on the board and just did whatever he wanted until the bitter end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't watched that one yet. that's, That's next on the list. I finished finish succession or finish succession which is also very timely yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well and then, you're, you're going to be blown away by the uber uh, mini series oh i can't wait to see it so yeah. john is we're um kind of wrapping down here is there anything else we, we, we haven't asked you that we want to talk about um well do i have time for one more quick story absolutely Okay, so that's exactly, that's a great segue. I want to talk about absolute vodka. No, so, yeah, I want to hear about that. So in the early 80s, Stolichnaya was a really rocking and rolling brand. And the Russians shot down a Korean jetliner out that. of the sky. And everybody was in the streets pouring Stolichnaya down the sewer. So absolute happened to be waiting in the wings. And that's when Absolute started to grow at the expense of Stolichnaya. And we, we all know how, what a great brand Absolute is and grew to be. But they also made a fatal error. They, the research told them, and I was working with Absolute at the time, you need to come out with a father of Absolute brand, something that's more premium. And they, the Sw- Swedish government owned Absolute at the time. And they refused to do that. And a brand named Kettle One came in above them and they took that spot. And Absolute, when they saw this, then they reacted and tried to introduce their own brand under a different name and a different package. And they failed miserably. And it's another example of listen to what the research tells you. Mm -hmm. And they refused because they thought they were smarter than everybody else. Yeah, I remember that. That is that is great. That's a great story. On the what what did Absolute come out with? What was their other brand? Oh, it was called Sun's Ball. Sun, I okay, Sun's Ball. Yeah, and it was it was a it had like a mustard type of cap in a mm-hmm. more slender bottle, and they just couldn't get arrested. You know, Stoli didn't make the same mistake. They came out with Stoli Elite. So at least, you know, if you're a Stoli consumer, you have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's. hmm. So in in today's environment with Stoli, no one's really, it's taken a little hit with uh, the current current conflict in Ukraine. (laughs) Yeah. God, God love those people. They're fighters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, John. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, They can go to my website, McDonald Speaks. Yes. M-C-D-O-N-N-E-L-L Speaks. And um, I'll go to my LinkedIn page, John McDonald, M-C-D-O-N-N-E-L-L. And um, I'll accept your invitation. Absolutely. And you make some, have some great presentation topics. um, What type of places do you speak at for people that may be curious and engaging you? Oh, I'm, I'm happy to speak anywhere. I speak mm-hmm. at different marketing groups. Mm-hmm. I guess lecture at colleges or, you know, master's degree programs, but a lot of, you know, digital and e-commerce conferences now. Mm-hmm. 
you know, in any obviously drinks industry organizations that will have me. Sure. Well, I got to say, you're fountain of knowledge. Well, I really appreciate you reaching out and setting this up and giving me the time. Yeah, it was really nice talking to you, John. Very knowledgeable. Thank you. Thanks. And will you um, send me a link to this when it's available? Absolutely. I will. Thank, thank you so much, John. Yeah. All right. Have a great weekend. Thanks for having me. You too. You thank too. you. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Oh, 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 oh